Thank you very much. You've probably all noticed that your devices are getting smarter and more capable at a very rapid rate that uh, a few years ago you expected uh, mistakes when you made a phone call and you got an uh, automated system answering rather than a human being. Now sometimes those calls are greatly superior to what happens when, when you talk to a human being. So all this is tending in a direction that we call the technological singularity. And this means that at a certain point in time, machines will be smarter not only than individual human beings, but than the whole human race combined. And that point is thought to be reached at tw the year 2045. Many of you are thinking that you won't be alive in 2045, but that's not correct because longevity is also increasing. So you will experience what I'm talking about. This is not just theoretical. This will happen in your life. And so we are teaching, as far as we know, the only course in the world that talks about this <laughs> at the University of uh, Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. What? When is the next course? <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's every term, and there is broadcast quality uh, video of every single teaching session. So you can all experience this if you're outside of China. The, one of the reasons I wanted to speak here is that YouTube is not accessible in China. And I would like to find some way that people in China can also watch our uh, broadcast quality videos. So what is the technological singularity? Where did that word come from? It's borrowed from physics. There's this area of uncertainty close to a black hole in physics. And this is something like that. It's an area of, of human activity that's completely unpredictable. We, we cannot predict what's going to happen when suddenly machines are in charge of the future agenda of the world. And uh, at that point, we will not be able to understand what's going on unless we cooperate with these super sentient machines or merge with them in some way. And not only can they think, act, and communicate so quickly that normal humans cannot understand what's going on, they can self-improve. They can evolve much more quickly than human beings can. So the moment, let it say, say that it's 2045, where they're smarter than all human beings combined, the next year they'll be much, much, much smarter than that. So they, they will, these super sentient machines will, will evolve much more quickly than we biological beings possibly can. And from that point onwards, technologic advancement is explosive under the control of machines and thus cannot be accurately predicted and that's called the technological singularity. And Ray Kurzweil is the person who's written about this the most. This thinking is based on Moore's law, which is this plot, uh, exponential plot of price performance of computing. And what it predicts is actually very relevant to life today. That is that one year from now, Machines will be as smart as a mouse <laughs> so in 2015. And in 2023, nine years from now, machines will be as smart as a human being. And in 2045, they'll be as smart as all combined uh, human beings. This obviously has tremendous implications, not only for uh, human society, but also for uh, medicine, my field. And before 2011, if you knew nothing about this, 
that was excusable because it was not mainstream. Nobody was talking about this. But suddenly, in February 2011, it became mainstream in two ways. And probably one or the other of these would have touched your life somehow. It was on the cover of Time magazine, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. And pretty much most of that issue is, is about these uh, futuristic ideas. And in that same month, in the TV game show Jeopardy, a computer, Watson, beat the top human contenders over three consecutive days in such a manner that it became clear that this wasn't just a fluke or a one-time occurrence, that by the third day, the machine was so good at Jeopardy that not only could it beat these top human contenders, but it could also then beat any human being. It was now better than any human being at the game of Jeopardy. And you know that had already happened with chess, with checkers, with many other things. Whatever is your favorite game, probably computers are already better than human beings. And the, the, it, it, there's no going back that, that, that in a lot of uh, settings, the computer has completely solved the game. It can play a perfect game, whereas uh, human beings are not capable of that. So around that same time, we began planning this course called Technology and the Future of Medicine. We did focus groups with undergraduate and graduate students, and the way we run the course has a lot to do with what those students told us they wanted in the course. They wanted a course that's accessible to the public. Anybody can come and sit in the seats and listen to the lectures. Anybody, except in China, can watch the broadcast quality YouTube videos of every teaching session, not only the lecture, but also the student discussion. And if you do that, you'll find that our students are, are very, very interesting, highly selected people. Our u university has about 25,000 students, and 14 out of those 25,000 take the course every term. <laughs> that's, that's quite a selected group of brave, uh, forward-looking students from all faculties. So they come from the faculty of business, arts, science, medicine, the best and the brightest students and faculty from across the campus teach in this course. The usual pattern is a 10-minute introduction by me, a 50-minute lecture by the lecturer, and then a 20-minute discussion. And um, in the course, we talk about machines replacing many of the functions of human beings. And that camera that you see there is a part of the course, too. That is not only a video camera. It is also taking still pictures, making the decision of which still pictures to take using a software algorithm of, 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 of facial expression and hand gestures and things. And often, the pictures it takes are greatly superior to what any human uh, photographer could do. So there's no human being taking pictures in our course, but we end up with really excellent, fascinating pictures taken by the video um, camera. Just, just, just one example of, of situations in which computers are better than people in many ways. And we, we've improved a, a lot in terms of the quality. This was our first teaching session, and you can see everything is wrong there. The lighting, the sound, the, the, the air handling in the room. <laughs> now we, we, we have really a perfect circumstance. And you, you will see if, if you watch the videos that, that pretty much the audio and the video quality is, is as good as you could possibly get. 
And I'm, I'm looking for a way to create a, a channel in China so people in China can watch these videos too. There are very surprising effects. Each student gives a student presentation, a 20 minute uh, presentation, same length that I'm giving you now. And these are put on YouTube. In one instance, this student, her video entitled The Immortal Coil, An Analysis of Existential Risks Created at the Dawn of the Singularity. Um, within three days, she was offered a job from a new tech startup uh, company in New York City that she knew no nothing about. A job beyond her wildest dreams. She had no idea such a job even existed. And it fit in exactly. She was done with all her undergraduate requirements. She wasn't going to start grad school for a while. She had this gap. And it was just a magical thing. She got this phone call offering her a job that beyond anything she could have, could have imagined simply on the basis of this broadcast quality YouTube video. And we, we are very proud also that we have tech skeptics, people who are very skeptical about technology, people who I know it's shocking, may walk around without any devices in their pockets. They're proud of not using email. You've met those kind of people. They teach in the course. So in the course, we, ha we have a spectrum of uh, points of view all the way from tech advocacy to tech uh, skeptics and everything in between. Whatever you're feeling right now <laughs> about this idea of machines becoming smarter than we are, that view is also represented in the, the classroom. And what we guarantee people is that we cannot tell you which of the scenarios we teach in the course will be the future, but almost certainly one of them will be. So if you take the course, you're sort of street smart for the future. You're prepared more than most ordinary human beings for this future that, 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 that is certainly going to unfold. Will this uh, be a utopia? Will it be a disaster? We, we don't really know, but by studying this, we can help to shape the future. We are not just passive victims of the future. We can help determine what that future will be. And I, I, I guess if you wanted to distill it down to its, to, its, to its essence, that is the main thing that we're aiming for with this course, is to influence the future. So um, we grade the students on the basis of a paper, a, a presentation, and class uh, participation. There are no exams. There's no required content. They can focus on whatever area they wish, as, as long as it fits with, within what we're teaching in the course about uh, exponential change. Um, and uh, so, um, it's, it's a very unusual course from that point, point of view. So the, the course content also talks about existential risks, things that could happen that could wipe us all out. We may never reach 2045. This may be academic. We, the human race may not get there. We, we may be wiped out before then. Um, uh, so artificial intelligence, genomics, nanotech. We spend a lot of time on ethics and ways to optimize a positive outcome for humanity and the co-evolution of humans and machines and the influence of these considerations on medicine of the future. Many prominent people speaking, uh, the dean of science, uh, prominent people internationally, those of you without a medical background would find every lecture in the course understandable by you with the exception of one. So they, they, the way you would define medicine, most of the lectures are, 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 are not medical at all. They, they, they are more broad than that. 
with a very balanced view provided by the inclusion of tech skeptics. And so there's the problem of audience heterogeneity. Um, as we also have here, some of you have heard of this before, some of you haven't. Um, but really, I, I think if, if one has genuinely new and interesting ideas, you should be able to satisfy both groups. So those of you who already knew what this term meant, who already knew that I was teaching such a course, hopefully you're getting something from this. And those of you who find this all shockingly new and you have no idea what's going on, you're, you're getting something out of it too. The most interesting aspects have to do with the impact on young people today. Because when I tell an entire audience you're all going to be around in 2045, so this is relevant to your life, your job, you'll see whether what I'm talking about happens or not. It's not just the futuristic thing after you're gone, it's, it's a part of your life. Young people particularly <laughs> have to accept that that's true. The older people in the audience, they, they may question wh whether what I'm saying is correct. But for young people, there is no question that these considerations will be a part of your life. Um, and so there's a considerable youth orientation in, in the course. The faculty teaching in the course are getting younger and younger. I joked once that we had not yet had faculty arriving by skateboard, but then we, we did. So here's one of our faculty members arriving by skateboard, a proof of the youth culture. And um, the other innovations this year, uh, it's now an official medical student uh, elective. We have a young person, old person counterpoint lecture. So I, I think it's, it's not very valid to talk about this from only one point of view. So we have a 29-year-old and a 75-year-old uh, as a tag team talking about this, the, the same issues uh, from, from their two different points of view, medical e ethics in a world of robots, what will we allow when everything is possible. I said this was the only course of its kind in the world, and that's true, but we would like that situation to change very quickly, and the other reason that I talk about this is I would like to stimulate other people to, uh, to give similar courses. It takes a bit of courage. The first uh, semester that we taught this, we had no regular students taking it for a grade. The next semester, we had two. The next semester, we had five, and then nine, and then 14. So most people would have given up the uh, semester when they had zero students or two. And, and, and so it takes a bit of uh, persistence and belief in, in, in what you're doing. And realizing that most people are looking for a job, for life experience with precedent. They want to be doing something the same as what other people have done before. They want to take a course that's the same as what other people have taken before. They don't want to step off into the edge and do something no one's done before. So in any university, the number of people willing to do something without precedent that nobody has done before is very limited. So, so you have to face that. But there is one other similar course. There is a course on disruptive technologies in medicine in Budapest, uh, Hungary, that's somewhat similar to our course. And the guy who runs that, believe it or not, is an MD, PhD, who's 29 years old. Not only that, but he's in the early point of his 29th year. He, he won't be 30 until November. So he, he's a really cool guy who's, who's packed a lot of li life experience. His name is Bertolin Mesco. And we're constantly seeking ways to enhance the intellectual ferment, the exchange of ideas in the course, and your input would be very welcome in that. How are we doing disseminating this uh, information? I think one can look at that uh, from a quantitative point of view. 
Many of you would be aware of the PBS uh, television program Nova. That reaches 7 million viewers. The um, comedy Big Bang Theory, which teach, uh, talks about many of these same issues, reaches 20 million viewers. So probably that is the potential audience. And how many of those people are we reaching? The largest meeting talking about this stuff, those videos reach 9,000 people, and our course videos max out at 2,500. So we have a long way to go, <laughs> from 2,500 to uh, 20 million, but we're trying. Sometimes people find this frustrating because they say this singularity he was talking about, what is it? I can't, can't grasp it. So the, the person who's done the most to make it tangible is um, a, an AI researcher, Marcus Hutter. He's talk, talked about what this will be like, what it will look and feel like. From the outside, uh, it, it, it will be like white noise. But the big risk, he feels, is human insignificance. The, the idea that the, the, the machines just won't care about us. Why should they? The same as when you walked here, if there was an ant or a cockroach or something in your path, you didn't like it or dislike it, you just didn't care. Well, maybe the machines will feel the same about us. And so that's really scary. It's, it's different from the problem of unfriendly AI. And, and, and unfriendly AI, the, the idea of artificial intelligence smarter than we are actively seeking to wipe us out may not turn out to be much of a problem. But the fact that the super sentient machines don't care about us could be a, a, a serious problem. And even if, if we are augmented through machine implants, even if initially our biological brains count for something, very soon processing power of the machine implant will va vastly outstrip our biological brains. And it's not clear at that moment that human identity will mean very much. If an idea began with your name on it, but if then machines enhanced it a million fold and made it much better and much bigger, is it still important that your name be, be attached to it? I, I think human uh, identity may change. And we'll be in sort of stuck in a dysphoric, eternal youth. Many youth act out because they, they, they feel that they don't have much power in the world, no one cares about them. Well, we, we may all feel like that. We may be all stuck in this dysphoric, eternal youth. Um, in China, you're probably aware that the Foxconn company has replaced one million workers with one million robots. And that's wor working very well. Uh, the human workers there were quite unhappy. The, the robots work around the clock. And each one of you, your lives have been touched by this because whatever device you're carrying in your pocket made by Apple or Samsung uh, was made here in China in this factory and is now being made by robots. So medicine, we could eliminate all diseases, still have a terrible world. And um, you can imagine that one of the, the, the things that needs to be kept in mind is the social responsibility of medicine. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. Rudolf Virchow said, social problems should be largely solved by them, looked upon that way. Even if medical advances get rid of all diseases that we know today, there's still human enhancement and improvements in society. So there's still lots to do in medicine. And the things that, uh, that I'm telling you about now will profoundly change medicine. So, I would like your suggestions 
for how to capture the imagination of the public, to start everyone thinking about these matters. That would be most <coughs> welcome. How resistant do you yourself feel to them? Are, are you close to leaving the room? Because <laughs> these ideas are so <laughs> unpleasant. You, you, you can imagine, though, that, that a world controlled by machines could be a very, very uh, utopian world. The you know, machines may decide we need the world to be much greener. You wake up the next morning and everything's green and the oxygen tension is higher and the, the air quality is better and the, the sea level is going down and so on. Global warming has been reversed. Whatever bothers you at the moment has been fixed by these machines overnight. Um, so, and you are all, every day you face the, the problem of unfulfilled reality. There are things you want that you can't have. Potentially here there is a future in which that will never be the problem. Anything you want you can have. Virtual reality experiences are better than real reality. Virtual reality can be shared with friends. So and everything, the, the price of valuable things today decreases to essentially zero. This could all happen with uh, the influence of these super sentient machines. There are also terrible things in the opposite direction that could ha happen. We need the mainstream public to regard this merger of humans and, and machines as fact, not fiction. We need to promote organized thinking about the future in universities and beyond. We need to conceptualize ways to increase our reach for this one course to the world at large. And we need to think of China-specific solutions to this problem. And in particular, where could my videos from the course be shown to you know, disseminate the, these ideas within China? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. There are Chinese YouTube. Uh, I, I actually watched them yesterday. Uh -huh. So you can, I don't know if you can upload from America, but you can simply give it to somebody in China and upload it. Yes. Yes. Work. Yeah. You have, you have like five Chinese YouTube channels. I googled it yesterday and I found five. So, yeah. yeah, it it's a I've I've oversimplified it here. Most uh, videos on YouTube based outside of China cannot be accessed wi within China, but it's it's not a simple matter. Um, and I'm not asking this audience to necessarily solve that. What I am trying to do with this audience, maybe, is to get you to think about the fact that already, every day, things are happening in your life to confirm that machines are getting smarter than we are even today. And that's obviously going to impact not only on medicine, but every other career. You can think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and Eventually, very soon, maybe 20 years from now, machines will be able to do things at every level except the top. <laughs> we'll all be stuck at the top of Maslow's pyramid of, of needs at the self-actualization <coughs> part. And you meet people every day who you don't think would be very happy or... or, 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 or that you just can't imagine them functioning up there. So how is this really going to work? I Do you think, I mean, computers now are programmed such that they are for our benefits. Yes. Yeah, and you have these machine learning things, so the, the goal in the end in every algorithm is beneficial for us. Yes. And there's also no need for a computer to change that. But, I mean, that's my question. Do you think that could happen? Yes, well, certainly it, it can happen. Whatever barriers we set to machines changing their own code, I, I can't really uh, imagine why 
a computer smarter than a human being couldn't uh, outwit those barriers. But it doesn't have a need. Computers don't need anything. Well, they, they, they are motivated by whatever their program motivates them by, right? So there, there, there are no assumptions that we can be certain of like the assumption that we built them, therefore they have to do what we want them to do. No, I, I think it's just like having children, right? The assume, if you assume that your children will you know, obey you in every instance throughout your life, that, that's not logical. Well, this will be sort of similar to that. Um, so what, what do you think? Do, does this... Can, can you think of some flaw in, in, in this? Is there some reason that everything I've, I've told you here won't happen? That these are not necessary things to think about? That actually in your life this won't happen? Well, no, no. See, I think every t that's what all of you would be would would be looking for here. The psychological out is very simply to seize upon something that's the essence of humanness that machines can never do. And once you find it, you feel good inside, and so on. But that's completely false. If 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 you look at the new movie. Um, uh, transcendence that, that came out just a week and a half ago on uh, the 18th. In that movie, the dialogue is mainly boring and un uninteresting. The peak is when, when, when they answer this question that, that you've just asked about you know emotions and, and uh, things. And so the peak dialogue in that movie is when they say that you know, the, the crucial difference between humans and machines is that irreconcilable logical conflicts, machines can never deal with those, whereas human beings can. And this is the essence of love. There are these irreconcilable logical conflicts. Well, that's so satisfying to listen to. And you say, wow, well, finally I've got a quotable line from this m movie that seemed to have no quote quotable lines. But then, then you think about it. As soon as you give the, that challenge to a sentient machine, it's going to say, aha, well, you know, you humans are not so good at that. Look at how you screw up love <laughs> right and left. So I can get better. I'm not going to be perfect. But... As a machine, I can be better than a human being at dealing with these uh, irreconcilable logical conflicts. And anything else that you think about, any job that you're convinced that only a human being can do, that, 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 that a you know, machine can never do, you'd be surprised that probably already there are machines that are doing it better. Psychotherapy, for instance, there are many psychotherapy uh, situations where people would prefer to tell their private thoughts to a you know machine that's non judgmental than 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 to a person. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We also apply these machine learning algorithms. Yeah? So we, we make algorithms that improve their own algorithm. Yes. So and what we what we now see you in our databases, yes, yeah, so just an example. Um, we used to think, okay, we have this data and this data. Is there a correlation? So you made a script to find if there's a correlation. Yes, no. But now we just ask the system, just go through all the data and find a correlation for me. And mm -hmm. keep on doing that. And, uh, so, and then things come out that you would never expect it. Yes. And that's, you can never think of it yourself. And the computer can find it out. It's just amazing. I, I would leave you with just one more thing, though. We all talk about you know, machine le learning. We pretend that every machine is going to have to learn. I mean, it's just natural. We think, well, geez, you know, how is it going to learn? So on. But once a super sentient machine is created that's already figured out the answer to most of these things, 
making a second, third, and fourth one is easy. There's, there's no learning. It's like, you know, an octopus. And an octopus is remarkably smart with no mentoring. There's, there's no parent-child interaction there. It, it knows what it knows because that's the way its brain is. So the, the constant emphasis on what will machines be able to learn becomes meaningless when the machines are so darn smart that just replicating a second machine like this first one is already going, going to be in complete command of whatever situation you can possibly think of. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for... Thank you again. Yeah.